Welcome to the library. It's good to see all of you here tonight. I'm Virginia Harriman. I'm the manager of the store. Um, this is our second Library Live event at Labyrinth this week. April's a busy time. And this event is co-sponsored by Princeton's Department of African American Studies and the Humanities Council. So thanks to everyone uh, who helped us make this happen tonight. Tonight we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Imani Perry, whose new book, May We Forever Stand, has just appeared from UNC Press. This book, which examines and celebrates the great anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is the latest work in the John Hope Franklin series in African American history and culture. Imani Perry is professor of African American studies at Princeton. She's the author of many publications, including More Terrible and More Beautiful, The Embrace and Transcendence of Racial Inequality in the United States. Dr. Perry will be joined by her colleague, Kenobi Nishikawa, assistant professor of FM studies at Princeton. <coughs> We'll begin a conversation between our two guests and then open up for your questions. And let's begin by welcoming them. Thank you, Virginia, and um, indeed, thank you, Amani, uh, thank for you. inviting me to be in conversation with you about your wonderful new book. Um, this is really an extraordinary undertaking and an extraordinary outcome. Uh, May We Forever Stand is not just a history of the Black National Anthem, um, but for me at least, uh, really a history of our 20th century mm -hmm. and looking forward to the 21st century. Um, and I hope to touch on what I mean by that in the course mm -hmm. of today's conversation. Uh, but for those who may not know, um, of the Black National Anthem. I wonder mm -hmm. if we can just start um, with you telling us a little bit about the anthem and uh, the brothers who wrote, uh, who wrote it and who composed the music. Okay, sure. Um, and you know, thank you all for being here. And of course, thank you, Kinohi, for um, being in conversation with me. It's such a, um, it's a, such a pleasure. So. So the brothers uh, who wrote the song, um, their names are James Weldon Johnson and John Rosamond Johnson. They were born in the 1870s uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. They are the children of a Bahamian mother and a Virginian father um, who met in New York and then traveled during the Civil War down to the Bahamas and lived there for a while and then post-war moved um, back Back, moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And Jacksonville is a relatively free, I mean, it's hard to say, no, no place was free <laughs> in that period, but re, you know, not quite as much racial violence as many other parts of the South because it's a resort community. Mm. Um, they are, their mother is a teacher, their father is a waiter at an upscale resort. So they're in the members of, of the black middle class. Um, and they um, are raised to be both race men in the sense of that period, which was like, you know, uh, the ideal of um, a person for whom all their accomplishments really are accomplishments for the entire race, a sense of, of striving associated with personal accomplishment, and also Renaissance men. Mm -hmm. They both have to leave Jacksonville because there's not a high school for them to attend there. There's not a, not a high school for black students in that period. Um, and uh, Rosamond is primarily a composer. James is, you know, sort of does everything. Like, I mean, he's overshadowed by Du Bois, but other than that, he's sort of, yeah. he's, a first, he's the first black person admitted to the bar in Florida. He eventually becomes secretary general of the NAACP. He's a principal, he's a novelist, he's a poet. Um, I mean, he's, yeah, he's extraordinary. And so, um, so they, uh, at the point at which they write the song, 1900, they're both educators. So Rosamond is a music instructor at the Florida Baptist Academy. James is uh, the principal of the Stanton School, which they graduated from. Um, and he, th they write the song ostensibly for um, a celebration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. But the text of the song, it becomes pretty clear it's not about Lincoln. It's, it's a song that is about you know, the history of black Americans told in epic terms. It's a song about resilience, it's a song about endurance, it's a song about struggle, right? It's a song that teaches a sense of responsibility, a kind of political responsibility. So they say, but they, they have 500 school children in Jacksonville, Florida sing the song. 
and they sort of forget about it. But the song spreads on its own. Um, and the children teach it to other children. They, both of them eventually move to New York mm -hmm. and it just starts to spread organically. And it begins to be referred to as the National Negro Hymn initially, uh, very early in the first decade uh, of the 20th century. And, and it's really adopted. I mean, it, it's hard, there's not many examples of the kind of organic adoption of a song that is def defined as an anthem that happens rather quickly. Yeah. I think um, just that starting point helps us understand um, the choice of cover. Yeah. Uh, this truly was um, uh, a song, an anthem, uh, that had its start at the Stanton School. Mm -hmm. uh, its first singers were, were children, children. Um, were school children. Uh, would you like to say just a few things about the cover of the book? Which, yes. by the way, I hope you all pick up a copy so you can look along with me. But yes, um, so I um, I am a little heavy-handed about book covers, <laughs> and so you know we were talking about talking to, to my editor about covers, and I was so I started looking for images, and I was deli very deliberate in use it, looking for images that um, were available. Um, in terms of not being under copyright because yeah. of the cost. Yeah. And I just started looking for images of children in Florida singing, black children, yeah. you know, segregated schools, Florida. And this image came up on the Alamy website, which is a, a website that has the sort of images that are available for use. Yeah. Uh, and for me, both, I mean, it seemed, you know, it's not certain who what they're singing, but the odds are quite good that it was yeah. Lift of Your Voice and Sing because yeah. it was such a common song to be sung yeah. by school children. And the trees yeah. and the texture yeah. of um, uh, the texture of the of the um, Florida and the fauna in the, in the yeah. picture yeah. is so characteristic of coastal Florida. Yeah. And so yeah. for me, it just captured the sensibility, although obviously yeah. it's a mid-century photograph, but the, the sense of that place. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Another aspect of the photo that I think ties in nicely with um, the book is indeed the um, school children's dress. Yeah. Their very formal dress. And one of the <coughs> incredible things about May We Forever Stand is that it gives a name to the kinds of institutions and practices yeah. that went into sustaining this kind of organic grassroots spreading of the anthem. Yeah. And the name you give it is Black Formalism. Mm -hmm. Black Formalism. Um, just an incredibly generative uh, sort of concept to describe mm -hmm. these practices, um, but also a way for us, for readers, to appreciate something that we don't necessarily always see or come to appreciate. Can you say a few things about black formalism and how that's really at the center of your your recovery of this history? Yes, thank, I mean it's um, it's so important for me. Um, yeah. You know, we talk a lot. I mean, there's two things. One is um, as academics, uh, we've over the last several generations, there's been a lot of work in black studies yes. on vernacular culture that I think is very important. That's been a lot of my work too. Yeah. But my feeling is, part of my feeling was that it hasn't been balanced by a sense of the formal culture that coexisted, right? So that when, you know, if someone is at the juke joint or the blues club, right? Yes, they're also at church, but they were also at various other kinds of formal or, you know, yes. uh, uh, organizations or yes. events. Um, so I wanted to give a sense of that and I was really, I thought it was really important because, you know, we talk about like the end of Reconstruction, yeah. Jim Crow comes down, right? Uh, it's described as the nadir of American race yeah. relations by Rayford Logan, this period of, you know, kind of absolute exclusion, violence. And at the same time, it's this period of incredible growth yeah. in black institutional life. Yeah. So, and, um, so there's like a world within a world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really extraordinary. And I think it's also meaningful because for black Americans, the end of slavery meant here's an opportunity to create an institutional life, right? So most places that sort of descends organically, if you actually exist in a society that excludes you from that, there's actually this sort of 
possibility to imagine. How do we want to structure ourselves? So I'm very interested in those institutions. Um, and uh, and also how they fit into sort of American associationalism generally. Like mm -hmm. that Americans belong to a lot of organizations right. and you know and, and, and associations. And so they built this fat this yeah. network of institutions that had lots of formal practices associated yeah. with them and the singing of the song is central to them. Right. So civic associations, schools, um, you know, very, the, you know, Elks clubs right. and political organizations, all these sorts of right. institutions. So I wanted to give a name to it um, to, to understand that as a really important social practice and also yeah. to understand how much that practice was a precursor to the movement mm -hmm. in, the, in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. that, it, that mm -hmm. so much of the socialization that happened through those institutions yeah were actually a foundation of political yeah. organizing later. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's one of the the kind of extraordinary things about the book is that it is both right a history mm -hmm. of 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 the anthem, mm -hmm. as well as and in some ways you can't extricate the two a history of civic and associational life yeah. in Black America. Mm -hmm. And what, what struck me is that in reading the book, because it, it goes from 1900, the anthem's first singing, to our present, um, you almost sort of read the 20th century and certainly African-American history differently. Mm -hmm. It's a history not of sort of landmarks or charismatic leaders, but really a history of ordinary people mm -hmm. <laughs> building institutions um, on their own and giving impetus and drive to mm -hmm. what would percolate as a movement to our eyes. And the Black National, national Anthem becomes the anthem of that, of that yes. energy. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it, it really was kind of extraordinary in, the, in that you. regard. Um, the, the irony for me is that when you do have the civil rights movement uh, uh, sort of coming to the fore in the 50s and, and mm -hmm. early 60s, um, the anthem experiences a bit of a wobble. Yep. And um, I found that interesting. C can you describe that little sure. wobble and, and why that was in, in, yeah, important? Yeah, so, yeah, so, um, well, so one of the things I was start by saying, one of the things I'm really interested in is like why the song is so resilient, yeah. right? To why does it stick around so long? And also why do people with very different political ideologies hold fast to the song, yeah, right? That's true. So a natural place for it to have kind of waned or fallen by the wayside would have been the, the 60s, right? So, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, you know, the NAACP yeah. as an claimed it as its official song in 1920 and subsequently said it's not an anthem mm -hmm. because there is one national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, after it was made the U.S. National Anthem in 1935. And that sensibility was about if we're fighting for inclusion, yeah. right, the, this kind of nationalist sensibility of having a separate anthem is a little bit right. problematic, right? So. So in some ways, so I just say that to mention, you know, the fight for inclusion yes. that is, you know, you know, the kind of 54 to, it depends on, you know, 54 to 67, 68 movement, right? Yeah. Um, you could see why that wouldn't quite, quite be the same, have the same kind of energy that period. Yeah. But, but the reason really um, for the shift is, is, I think, at least threefold. So one is that as um, organizers were coming from northern states, and the Living Your Voice and Sing is very much, it's not exclusive to the South, but really rooted yeah. in, in the, yeah. the American South. Yeah. As they are coming from northern states to get involved in, in, the, struggle, in, the, in the freedom movement, many of them don't know Lift Every Voice and Sing. Mm -hmm. So there are accounts from work organizers in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee where they're surprised that yeah. these people, they don't know the song. Mm -hmm. um, and then also that with the direct action protest of the early 1960s, it actually worked much better to have a song like We Shall Overcome or We Shall Not Be Moved. Shorter, easier to learn, yeah. easily modified, yeah. doesn't need a musical accompaniment, right? You can just, and, and really sort of has that energy of direct action. Direct action. But I think, and so, you know, so, so those are a couple of the reasons I think you get the transition. What's interesting to me, though, mm -hmm. is that it comes up 
that bubbles up, right? So We Shall Overcome kind of displaces it. People even start to refer to it sometimes as the anthem of black America, right, in newspapers. Um, right. Uh, but then the really important moment, so for example, and I was talking about this um, yesterday of the anniversary, 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, assassination, um, the darkest moments, and he would, he would recite it in his sermons, you know, of the movement. You know, he would often cite the second verse, Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, right? Um, and so it was a message to, to the people who were in the movement. He was sending a message about not just the endurance for the moment, but the long history of endurance that was demanded of that period. Um, similarly, um, in Rome, Georgia, one of the places where children were involved in direct action, and they were kept uh, in jail for several days, and they would sing, lift every voice and sing. Right? So not at the protest, but in that okay. period when they were you know, when it was sweltering in the jail yeah. and they had inadequate food. And so okay. it continues to be a resource, yeah. even though it's not quite the song for the, the movement of the moment. And then, right. it, of course, it comes back with black power. Like, <laughs> 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 it comes back, and, and you mentioned it in your last response, but, and this is quite extraordinary to me, but it also precedes. Uh, in terms of its anthemic status, if you want to just call it that, um, the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can share some of the tensions um, between performing, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit of yeah. it, but some of the tensions between performing the Black National Anthem um, with or alongside the Star Spangled Banner, right. considering it, it, it is in fact the latter that, that the Star Spangled Banner that comes after yes. um, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Right, yeah. I mean, just, you know, so the Star Spangled Banner is named the National Anthem of the United States right. in 35, and it's by the teens that it's generally known that Lift Every Voice and Sing is, yeah. the, is yeah. referred to as the Negro yeah. National Anthem. So that in and of itself is interesting. Yes, um, uh, and there's debates at various moments, um, particularly in the, you know, there's debates in the black press about yeah. Does this make sense to have mm -hmm. an anthem other and and the debates take various forms. So some are like the one I just when I describe where it's about, you know, we're arguing for inclusion, we yeah. don't need a separate anthem, but some of them are like, let's not pretend that we have any power. Sure. Right? Yeah. You know, and there's a there's Ernest Lyons who's a um uh, kind of activist minister from um, Honduras, black minister from Honduras, is saying, you know, listen, we are dispossessed everywhere, you know, yeah. with the exception of Haiti and Liberia. What is this fiction of a national anthem, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are those kinds of debates. Yeah. Uh, in the 40s, you see in the context of the World War II effort, there's an emphasis on describing it as coexisting with the Star okay. Spangled Banner, right? That they, it's a patriotic song. What's interesting is that literary voice and saying doesn't mention race, and it doesn't specifically mention the United States. So it's open to, I mean, it's deliberately ambiguous, mm -hmm. right? Although it's very mm -hmm. clear that it's about black people. <laughs> um, and so, so it, there's sort of reinterpretations yeah. uh, at various moments, right? So the 40s yeah. is really reinterpreted to kind of a, uh, under the banner of patriotism. But then yeah. once you get to the late 60s, it's very much seen as a confrontation yeah. with the failures okay. of the United States. Yeah. To live up to um, to the to its creed, right? Um, That's right. Uh, and and it's associated. So there's um, so when after King is killed in Boston yeah. um, at Franklin Park, uh, the which is in the middle of Black community in Boston, people tear yeah. down the um, American flag, put up the Ghana Black Star flag, and sing "Lift Every Voice and wow. Sing," right? And so you know that energy is is a part of. Um, the way the song yeah. gets kind of revived. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I love about that response is um, you had mentioned that the occasion of the song's first singing was in celebration of Lincoln's oh. birthday at the Stanton School. Um, but you also make sure to point out that um, the spirit of the song, the ethos of the song, um, reflects in fact um, a birthday that happens two days later. Yeah. Frederick Douglass's yeah. chosen birthday of February fourteenth, yeah. and so you all from its inception, there's this duality of celebrating the nation, trying to force the nation to live up to higher standards, um, but also a sort of unapologetically um, 
black orientation. Yes, right? absolutely. And, and I, I, I really, um, at that point is really important yes. because um, another piece of how the song becomes deeply sort of embedded, particularly for children, which I think is one of the most important parts yeah. of the book, the second, you know, is talking about the songs in, in the lives of children, is through the celebration of Negro History Week, which is initially celebrated in the week it is because of Lincoln and, and um, uh, Frederick Douglass's birthday in February. You know, so people make jokes, why is Black History Month in the shortest, the shortest month of the year? Because Lincoln and Douglas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when, you know, so when, you know, Carter G. Woodson sort of formalizes the celebration of Negro History Week in 1926, the song in many schools in that week is not just sung, you know, many um, segregated schools, it's sung for weekly assemblies or maybe in the morning, but it becomes part of a whole curriculum. Yeah. Um, and, you know, vocabulary lessons, history lessons, yeah. pageants, the whole thing. And so right. there is that sense of socialization mm -hmm. into um, sort of a, a, a politics um, that is both, that, that is a protest politics, but it's also a critique. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has a, um, it's a real kind of sophistication when you think about what it means to have this curricula that teaches kids both the structure yeah. of the country as it is, but also its yeah. limitations, yeah. right? Yeah. These kind of layered lessons, yeah. yeah. Getting, getting the grain of that doubleness, um, it struck me, required a different kind of reading and a different kind of research than what scholars typically do. Um, this seemed like just an absolute joy to, to research and write, yeah. in part because the archives are not single authored, are not tied to a major politician or a major uh, single figure. Yeah. But this is really, really based in sort of the archives of black life. And yes. what, what was it like to research this um, and to really capture the grain of everyday life in black America. Yeah, I mean, it, it, just, it was a joy. <laughs> I mean, it was so much, you know, to go through kind of newspapers, yeah. graduation programs, you know, um, dressmaking school programs. I mean, yeah. it's just sort of like everything. And also memoirs and, yeah. um, uh, you know, conferences of the Southern Christian Leadership yeah. Conference and NAACP and like all of these and newsletters. I mean, and yeah. it was so joyful because so much was alive. I mean, it yeah. just kind of jumped off the pages. Um, and I have to say that someone had a lot of formal education mm -hmm. and had a lot of kind of instruction about archives, knowing one, where I went to look yeah. and having a sense of where to look did not really come from my academic training. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. came from knowing things through the fabric of my life and socialization yeah. and then that being able to collect things there, yeah. right? And so knowing, okay, so I know how to archive collect. I know now you know, what to do when I have thousands upon thousands of documents <laughs> and how to sort them. But going to places that I knew were important, yeah. that I hadn't, that I didn't know were important because someone had told me when they taught me, but because yeah. I know the story of this song was a living, you know, is a living kind of practice. Yeah. Um, it was really emotionally uh, rewarding. It was great. Yeah. yeah. There are so many details here, uh, as you say, drawn from the archives where we're just looking at how the song lives mm -hmm. in um, ceremonies from almost birth to death. Yeah and every point in between. Mm -hmm. um, and you also, there's, again, it really makes you rethink our conception of history, but also of literature. Uh, Maya Angelou, all the figures yeah. come up in terms of, they've all, if you just read closely, you can they see lift mm -hmm. every voice in, in all the great works. Oh yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, so, Angela Davis, Maya Angelou, Dizzy Gillespie, yeah, um, yeah you know, yeah. Stevie. I mean, it just yeah. it appears over and over again, yeah. um, and it and it's not just that it appears, but it appears 
for very particular reason mm. that we that I think hadn't been adequately mined. Yeah. So with Maya Angelou, you know, for those of you who've read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, it's her eighth grade graduation. There's this you know elaborate discussion of all the preparations. Yeah. These folks in Stamps, Arkansas. She goes to um, a county a country um, a county day school. Yeah. Um, in, in Stamps, Arkansas, and they, you know, folks are dirt poor, but they do all these preparation for graduation. It's a beautiful ceremony. All the formalism yep. is present. Yep. And then one of the white town officials comes to the ceremony and offers a completely demeaning and demoralizing speech and takes the air out of the room. And her friend, who is the valedictorian, um, turns that moment around by beginning mm. to speak the words of lift every wow. voice and sing. And so she writes about how mm. it restores the dignity of the mm. moment. And that yeah. is really, in so many ways, a function. Yeah. The song had a, a, a function of telling a different kind of story about what it meant to be black in America, right, right than the yeah. official story. Um, yeah. uh, and it, you know, so the ritual, like, was always repairing. You know, repairing a breach. So, yeah. yeah. And so it's it. You know, so it's great because you can like go through these books that I've read over and over again, and and you know, see them with see fresh them eyes. With fresh eyes. Yeah. I mean, that dignity, that grace, that elegance, which are part and parcel of black formalism, mm -hmm. of club women, of churchgoers, yes. of school children, um, and of institutional and associational life, yeah. right? Of civic culture. Um, where do you see that culture going in the 21st century? And, and by implication, where do, <laughs> you know, what's the fate of the anthem in the 21st yeah. century? Yeah, that's, I, um, so I, I mean, one of the things I talk about is Americans generally, we, we sort of have lost a lot of associational life, yeah. right? So when de Tocqueville said, you know, Americans join everything, they create a association <laughs> for everything. Um, that's no longer the case, yeah. right? We are not joiners, we, and that is also true of black Americans, right? So, you know, so in, a, in the section where I talk about Martin Luther King Jr.'s first public speech at the Colored Elks Club, which his father is a member of, and you know, he right. cites the anthem in the speech, he's yeah. 15 years old, 14 years old. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those types of spaces yeah. are not part of the fabric of our lives. And I guess the conclusion I want to, or that I get to is, you know, the song is really important to me personally, but yeah. the takeaway I think is less, you know, things come and go, right? You know, so there, and, and I don't, I'm not, I think of culture as something that is living, and so I don't, yeah. I'm not sort of into sort of fetishizing particular objects or artifacts, but what I do know is that what the anthem did yeah. is essential for sort of organizing and movement yeah. and freedom struggles. And so if it's not that, yeah. that's okay, but things like that are necessary, particularly in very difficult political times, yeah. uh, which is like the sort that we're in now. So I don't know what will happen. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm always, I'm interested in Lift Our Voices thing keeps popping up. Like yeah. it just, you know, so it'll seem like nobody knows it. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> like, it pops up here and there. Yeah. Um, uh, but it may, it, it probably won't ever have its former glory. Mm -hmm. But I do think that that, what it, what it did for people yeah. is important. And we have to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love that notion of when it does pop up, the, the almost the first impulse is to say, where did you learn that? Yes. Because it's a sign of something greater. It's That's a right. sign of a connection to history that is becoming increasingly under threat and, yeah. and dissipating yes. in, in our 21st century. Um, I think now is a great time to open it up to the audience. So if you have any questions, do, do, do we pass this around or Virginia? Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, two. One is a question. Who commissioned it? The song to be written. Um. So okay. I, I don't. I don't think it wasn't a formal commission. He was doing it as a um, for the school. He that was he. A principal. Yeah, he was the principal okay. of the school. Oh. Yeah. The other thing is, I wasn't introduced to it until I heard Denise Graves sing it. Oh. What a. Yeah. Gosh, I can't get it out of my mind. It, 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 
something but did Paul Robeson ever sing? Do you know, did, do you have a favorite pro, uh, performer? He, do you have a favorite yeah. performance? So I like the the Robeson question is really interesting because I don't I have never heard a recording. I mean, I'm sure he sang it. You know, so many people people saying it all the time in ritual occasions, but I don't think there's a recorded version. Although it's interesting because um, there's a parody of the song that was written by someone in the Communist Party, and there is that is like you know that sort of uh, kind of Robeson part of Robeson's crew of people that is sort of like kind of reinterpreting the song from the perspective of class struggle. Mm. <laughs> so, so that's just you know sort of interesting like. In the, in the midst of the popular front politics, sort of, mm -hmm. there are various ways in which um, black members of the far left tried to like take the fe features of the song, either through, like that was a written parody, but they were also um, in masses in mainstream magazines, just, mm -hmm. you know, um, a leftist magazine, they would, there were various kind of re, there were art, art, there was art representations of it, there were various ways of like trying to bring the song into the far left. So that's just sort of, um, but my favorite rendition is actually, um, I'll say I don't, it's not that I don't like recorded versions, I do, but they don't do quite the same thing as singing with people. Um, so when I, when singing it, I much prefer um, kind of the, one of the two conventional arrangements. One of the more recent arrangements, oh gosh, and I'm not thinking of his name. There's a professor at Tennessee State University who's been there for years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who has done the most popular rendition. They had, I mean, the most popular arrangement. It had to be arranged more easily um, post-1970s because we don't have as much formal musical training anymore, so people actually couldn't, can't sing the older version so well. Um, it's just a whole, a whole other, but, um, but I love Esther, Esther Satterfield, who's a jazz singer from North Carolina, did a uh, recorded version in 1974 that's really beautiful for um, an album titled Once I Loved. Um, she worked closely with Chuck Bangiani. Um, yeah, that's a good movie. Esther Satterfield, yeah. Please, yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you. Hi, cousin. Hi, cousin. I um, wondered if you came across or thought much about um, historically black colleges at games. Um, yeah. I went to Spelman, and we always stood and sang it at games. Yes. Is there much that you are interested in in that realm, like yeah. sporting events? So I had that in black space. Yeah. So I did not write much about sporting events per se, but I did do a lot of research in um, programs of sort of, of graduation ceremonies um, in historically black colleges, and, and, and one of the formulations towards the end is really HBCUs are one of the, you know, one of the few institutions now that continue with the ritual singing of Lift Our Feet Boys and Sing, right, in, in a way that's not just kind of once a year at the Martin Luther King Jr. breakfast or at the Black History <laughs> program, but like in a, you know, with, at, at games or chap, you know, various kinds of programs. Um, so in some ways it's like, you know, there's so much about black formalism that still exists at HBCUs, it's yeah. not virtually anywhere else, yeah. First of all, thank you for this great book. And um, the name you're uh, thinking about was Rowan Carter. Yes, Carter. that's yeah. right. And um, one of the things I do, I'm, I'm a high school teacher, and I've taught uh, the theory voice to sing in my English class. And so one of the tasks that I have my students do every year is to memorize all three verses, and they have to be tested on it. That's and, great. And I can <laughs> assure them when you hear it again, it will have such a different meaning to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I pro and so we've had a chance to go out to like Martin Luther King breakfast and they hear it and they're like, Mr. Kearney, you're right. It does have a different <laughs> meaning. And that just reminded me of how you start talking about your son yeah. and and um, his coming home talking about Lift Every Voice and Sing. So how do we continue to get this song out to the younger generations, because um, it's our responsibility, right? So how do we keep this alive um, among our, you know, our youth? Yeah. Well, I thank you. Um, 
I think that's what I mean. In some ways, it's what you're doing that's the only way because it has to be um, in the midst of learning, right? So that what you described is really, I mean, the, the tradition of that, right? In the 1920s and the 1930s of teachers using it for vocabulary lessons, for history lessons, for, you know, you have to memorize the verses. I mean, those, those practices are really the way that it becomes meaningful, right? So it's not just, I mean, I, you know, to be quite honest, I think what's part of what's so powerful about it to me is that it's not like the way that we tend to sing the Star Spangled Banner, mm -hmm. which is really just, I mean, it's like sporting events and like inaugurations, and it doesn't, you don't really pay attention to any of the words, like it's not, you know, it's sort of, it's, patriotism but doesn't tend to have a kind of deeper meaning attached to it and I think the power of lift of your voice and sing has always been this deeper meaning right um, that you're talking about that they hear the song differently by virtue of exploring the deeper meaning so the question for me is like as actually a bigger question about being committed to younger people in a, in a regular way like so I talk you know one of the things I'm gonna talk about in the book but I belong to an organization called um, the African American History and Culture Club but we met every single Saturday I had guests, it was like history lessons, writing, you know, we wrote a newsletter. I mean, it's all, you know, that type of practice, I think, is the key. And so unless, it, unless adults are committed to that, it's just not going to happen. Hi, thank you. Um, kind of in a similar vein, one summer when I was much younger, my dad sat me down and just gave me the first three verses and told me to memorize it. So that's definitely an experience I'm very familiar with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. And that was that whole learning experience was followed by the talk, the famous big talk that black parents have with their children about inequalities of black life in America. Um, but what I was curious about was uh, where you, was it, uh, Perry, first learned the song and how your own uh, relationship with the song evolved as you kind of navigated America throughout the years. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know where, I don't remember not knowing it. <laughs> so I don't know where I learned, when I learned it. Um, and we heard, I mean, I heard it a lot at home. I mean, so we played it, and then, you know, you singing it at events. It wasn't school, though, for me. I did, I, you know, um, uh, uh, so it was different, certainly, from my, from my parents' generation. I'll just say quickly that the, the, the book begins with me telling the story of my son coming home. He's five years old, and he goes to a Quaker school. It's a predominantly white school. And I was like, where did you learn this song? <laughs> And he said music class, and I was like, "Do you know what it is?" And he said, "Yeah, it's Black National Anthem." And he, said, you know, and um, and then I uh, we went home to Alabama. I was born in Alabama for Thanksgiving to my family, and I um, I asked him to stand up and perform the song. I said, "Tell him, sing the song that you've been learning." And he stands up, and my entire family stood up with him and raised their fists and sang. And, you know, so I keep, I keep telling this story. And his eyes are like saucers, you know. Um, and I, that moment is, is meaningful for me because, you know, one, it was emotional. Um, my grandmother had died recently, and it was just, um, but it was also, it gave you a sense of the it's kind of generational transitions, right? So I had, you know, my, my mother and aunts and uncles had learned it in one way, and I had learned it in another way. And then my child, and so he got a sense of this kind of two generations past, but, but not what my grandmother's experience was with the song, which would not have been a raised fist, you know. And so, so that, that, you know, um, so there are these different sort of generational experiences. Um, uh, but it's, I mean, it, that was actually, the question you ask is actually one of the difficulties for me as a scholar uh, in the sense that I have a very deep attachment to it um, emotionally and sort of how to let go of the impulse to be like, everybody needs to learn this song. <laughs> <laughs> and actually try to think critically um, and to think, and also to think critically about the debates around it was, you know, was a really a kind of meaningful exercise <laughs> for me, yeah. Yes, um, uh, Dr. Perry, I also want to thank you very much for um, your scholarship and lifting up 
this um, anthem in a new way through your work. I am curious, um, you mentioned, of course, there are other standards, uh, rather stanzas in this anthem that are more commonly used during Road Reach Watch. So could you talk a little bit about why you chose this particular one, right, maybe forever stand? Is it have uh, anything to do with um, the times we're living in? Is it or something, you, a message you're trying to get across to us? Oh. I'm just out of curiosity, why this one as opposed to I, any others? I love that question. Yeah. Yeah. Great um, question. So the first answer was, well, I knew I couldn't name it Lift Every Voice and Sing or Lift Every Voice because there are eight gazillion books named Lift Every Voice, <laughs> which is also, which is actually was interesting to me. Like that was, I think, a, an important um, detail about the power of the song, that there's mm -hmm. constant citations of it. There's, there's actually a section in Essence Magazine this month about books you need to read, and it says Lift Every Voice. It's not about my book. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it says Lift Every Voice in the section, which I think, you know, so, so that um, is telling. And then, but the, the Maybe Forever Stand for me, is, there's two p pieces. One is that one of the early debates I got into with people about the book is at the, the end of the third verse, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. Right? Uh, so I was born in 1972. For me, you know, coming up the generation I did, uh, amidst movement people, native land in Africa. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and others who I talked to with my generation had that same experience, but that was certainly not what everybody thought. And there are people who said, well, that means the United States. <laughs> right? no. And so I said, oh, this is fascinating. There's a kind of, because I think the Johnson brothers were very deliberate about building that ambiguity in, mm -hmm. like the, the sense mm -hmm. that it, there were multiple interpretations of that meaning. But then also, may we forever stand, because for me, one of the most important things is you stand for mm -hmm. Lift Every Voice and Sing, and that that standing for the singing has a, a social and political meaning that I think is very important. And so... It was. It's almost an appeal to the to the public, in addition to a statement about the book. As you know, make, you know, if you know, stand for this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so. Much. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, kind of what you're going on about how the um, the, the anthem connects with. Um, uh, black internationalism yep. in politics of Africa because like my clearest memory of it was um, when um, Professor Chinua Achebe led um, my graduating class in singing the song as we graduated from Africana Studies mm -hmm. um, and him kind of leading through the first verse and then all of us kind of picking up afterwards was really clear so that I was just wondering how you see the internationalist kind yeah. of perspective in that. Yeah, yeah that's, I, I, thank you, that's a great question, and I, um, yeah, I hope it's kind of clear in it, yet I, the book is a lot about the threat of black internationalism, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so, but really in the context of the United States. So, I actually anticipated that I would find more international references to the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing than I did. Um, but they really primarily were concentrated um, in Ghana, uh, and which made sense historically because of, of you know the relationships between um, as multiple like, but in Kruma and you know the, right, um, uh, and actually the, the college named after him has lived every voice and sing as its official song. Wow. Um, and then South Africa, um, because it was so often partnered with Nkosi Sikelele in the, the anti-apartheid struggle, and as it times was in, in South African theater. So there's just a few international connections. So it was a, um, a Jamaican album in the 70s that was um, dedicated to Bob Marley that featured the song. So there's like little bits and pieces. But um, when you look at the way the song fit, particularly in school curricula and pageants, um, the kind of big ceremonial performance pageants. It was, cons was consistently encased in a sense of an international black politic and history um, all throughout um, with the sort of brief like 1946 to 63 break which is very big things be and that's also when the song wanes. <laughs> And then, um, and, and I, for part of the story for me is that actually internationalism is central to black American politics. It's been a mischaracterization to say otherwise. And mm -hmm. what all you have to do is read black newspapers 
right, which now are all, I mean, it's, it's overwhelmingly digitized, and you see, you know, so there's news from rural Georgia and news from Ethiopia, news, you know, that that's, and part of it is a sense, and part of the kind is the kind of dispossession of black people all over the world actually becomes part of the impetus for an international politic, right? That it, that it isn't, that, that identity is not bound up with the specific nation state, but actually bound up with what this means, what does blackness mean in the face of the history of colonialism and the transatlantic slave yeah. trade. So, yeah, so, um, so it is, and just one other quick point though, is um, there are various moments where there's an effort to displace it that are connected at times to sort of international black politics. I'm thinking of Garvey initially uses Lift Every Voice and Sing at the beginning of some programs and then decides Ethiopia Land of Our Fathers is actually the national anthem, the na anthem of all black people. Um, it doesn't catch on because it's not a good song, really. Um, <laughs> it just didn't. I mean, he didn't write it. I mean, it's just, you know, but. Um, uh, so, what was interesting to me is that he initially was using it, um, uh, and similarly, the Black Panthers, you know, they um, they would use "Lift Every Voice and Sing" in various programs that they created their own anthem too, which was also not a good song. Um, and I mean, but I think that that's important. That there's yes. an aesthetic, you know, yes. if, if the song isn't beautiful, no. you're not. So it's not going to move people, right? right. So, right. sort of long-winded, sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you could segue a little bit. I didn't fully understand the origin of the phrase black formalism, yes. which I had never heard before. But it seemed to me an extremely powerful and important concept. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I mean, we haven't heard it because I kind of made it up. By the book. So it yeah. powers yeah. some stereotypes yes. in a deep way. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so I... Um, for me, it's so part of it is to distinguish. So there's been a lot of work that scholars have done on, and, and most sort of significantly, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham on the politics of respectability, which is essentially how, um, you know, the black organizations, many of which were associated with the church. Um, part of their politic of uplift or argument for social and political inclusion was to adopt um, behaviors that were associated with middle class respectability right, and impose them on black communities and argue that that was, you know, if you could make the argument that you're respectable, that would be part of the path for inclusion. And what I was interested in was making a distinction. Now it's not a complete distinction. It's there's, there's some practices, things that overlap, but between those practices that were directed externally and the ones that were really about internal practices that were ways of claiming dignity, of the importance of ritual, of the importance of grace, um, that does have a political implication because the society is, you know, is excluding and oppressing and this alternative world of being is being cultivated. And so, um, and I also wanted to draw the distinction between the kind of informal spaces and the formal spaces. So we, we talk about like, we talk about the difference between sort of church spaces and kind of, you know, the, the kind of more vernacular spaces in scholarship, that, and that's also really important, just like the politics of respectability is important, but there are so many other types of institutions that had an important cultural impact that were formal institutions um, that are sort of that one were not exclusively middle class or upper class that were not exclusively religious that were and that were woven into the fabric of everyday life. So I use the term to sort of capture the set of expectations. So it's a broad term. Like it's both, you know, the way people where you're supposed to dress and conduct yourself and the structure of ritual. A lot of it a lot of the rituals did have a kind of liturgical structure. They imitated the form of church ceremonies even if they weren't religious. Um, but yeah, so that's generally the, um, the, the way that I'm trying to use it. We have time for maybe two more questions. One over here. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I hear you telling a story about the institutional power of, or the song's power to kind of uh, both have a redemptive function 
and to be able to unite communities or unite people in type and build a type of culture that is not just content to be a counterculture, but is dependent also on building schools and building formal institutions that can house this type of song. And when you were speaking about how not to glorify the song, how you don't want to glorify it, that you want to leave room for the present moment for a new type of song to come about, I wonder if those, if the institutional preconditions for that are this are possible now, as opposed to in the 30s and 40s, where in, yeah. where associations were a lot stronger, mm -hmm. and where associations and, and uh, ran a lot of things, and, and you spoke about the disillusion of associations, and it seems like the song is so embedded yes. in that, and so is this is is, it, is this type of song possible today? And what would it mean to build institutions to, for it to be so? You know, I sort of, so when, with my last book, um, which was sort of about, I'll get, I'm not going to totally build your question, but your question made me think of this, like, which is sort of about, you know, how do we sort of try to do something different in the way that race functions? Like, people kept saying, why do you, you know, how is this going to be possible? Or why do you think this is possible? And I would, my response has always been, well, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1972, nine years after the 16th Street bombing, right? So I think a lot of things are possible <laughs> um, when I look at the difference between my life and my grandmother's life, which is not to, say, not to tell a romantic story, but I do think that it's possible, but it requires, I mean, I think exact, your point is exactly right, right? We do not have the institutional preconditions. Um, what would be required would be the same kind of deliberate cultivation and creation mm -hmm. of institutional life that has ritual attached to it. So I mean, I think about, you know, kids are in school every day, but so few of them have rituals about, that are about meaning, like yeah. the meaning of your life, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? And that's just, yeah. this is the kind of things that this, yeah. these kind of rituals were about. So there's a kind of, there's a, a set of ethical commitments about mm -hmm. how we live. So we participate in all these institutions, but we don't, they don't function. So one of the things I talk about is um, the concept of unisonance, right? What it, mm. when you sing alongside other people on a regular basis, what it does to yeah. you emotionally. And you don't have to know them to have, for it to have a kind of deep resonance, right? So that, that that's like not on in and of itself, but as you're saying, like embedded in, in practices. Um, for me, it's a you know that's a collective question, yeah. um, and it's a question I pose to myself as well because I don't make space for the kind for many of the kind of institutions which I benefited from. I don't make space for my life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a question I, I you know I'm posing to myself about how well how do I try to do this living differently? Yeah. Let me take one last question and then we can move to uh, more informal Q and A and sign. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just curious, the two brothers, did they live long enough to see the pervasive nature of what they created? Yes. Um, and James died in 1938, I think Rosamond in 54. But um, he said in his memoir, James Weldon Johnson, that of all the things he did, you know, and they, I mean, they wrote operas, they wrote popular Tin Pan Alleys. I mean, these are super accomplished people. Yeah. And he said, this was the most significant thing that I did. And, and I mean, in no way could have, and, and also was the Secretary General of the NAACP when he built it into a national organization. So, but had no idea that um, the song would have that kind of impact. But yeah, they, they love to see that. Great questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow.